Uh, my name is Hilda Tellol. We have this um, lecture series in our Central Informatics and Society. This is our third um, lecture on data interest ontologies, how business models distort science. And we are very glad to have Professor Klaus Kornbach today with us. Uh, I will tell you a little bit about him. He comes from Germany. He is born in Germany and studied mathematics, physics, and philosophy. So it's not only his work, which is interdisciplinary, also his all background and studies are very interdisciplinary. He had diploma uh, thesis on the topic of molecular spectroscopy and then uh, had the dissertation on analytische Sprachphilosophie. So analytical philosophy of language. Yes, I learned one. Um, afterwards, you have uh, been in several universities as lecturer and as researcher, and also at Fraunhofer uh, Institute for um, industrial production, engineering. industrial engineering, and production technology automatization and organization and uh, work sciences. All right, yeah, just yeah, I'm good in Stuttgart. And afterwards, uh, you worked also uh, as lecturer on topics like cybernetics, uh, simulation technologies, and model building, um, and also for philosophy, of course. Hello. Um, also in Stuttgart, but you have been also here at our university as lecturer, and in Budapest, in, in China, in several places. I think one of the achievements that uh, you had, what I want to mention in, mention in this topic, um, you are uh, an honorary professor for philosophy at Humboldt Centrum in Ulm, is it? University of Ulm. And uh, you got um, the prize, this SEL, for Schumann's Prize, was this SEL? I don't know. Is it, is it an acronym uh, for something? This is it's an electronic uh, Yes, yeah. for no, uh, no, I'll cut it. okay for tech, technology, tech, tech, technical communication. This was the subject, I think. Um, your focus, one of your focus, that in the last years and the later years, is um, philosophy of technology, and you were the director of the Center of Technology and Society. So this is something we have in common. We have your Center of Informatics and Society, and in the future our university will have a central, central, center for technology and society. So actually the same name. We will see how we manage to establish that at the university. Um, you had several publications and um, papers, and also you are a, a very well uh, uh, welcomed. Um, panelist and discussant in several uh, events. And today we have this interesting topic, and if uh, I miss something, you probably uh, put it into your presentation also. And thank you, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much for this kind of invitation. And thank you et al. for having a very, very honorable opportunity to have a talk here. Um, it was a long time ago when I was last time uh, at uh, some lectures here. I think it was 2002 or 2003 or so, uh, together with Wolfgang. Now, uh, I think in the meanwhile, something has been happened, and I would like to talk a little bit about that. OK. The, the topic of this of my talk tonight may be a little bit confusing, data address ontologies. It has something to do with uh, model building. You mentioned that I have uh, made lectureship in modeling and simulation, and uh, my concern was from a point of view uh, of the philosophy of science and philosophy of technology that uh, we are not aware enough about the limitation limitations, the mental limitations, the technical limitations, how we do really build models. And models, of course, or model building is a um, <coughs> business that is interest-driven. And I think we should be 
honor enough or uh, truthful enough to talk about this interest. And I would like to show you tonight a little bit uh, with respect to this model building um, and with all these new technological uh, possibilities we have, that we should be more aware about the interests uh, and therefore the underlying of my topic, how business models distort science. So we have actually a discussion whether, for instance, big data technology will substitute scientific methods, and whether we can win a better knowledge or a fast, or in a faster way, uh, knowledge uh, via big data than by science. Uh, to reduce any pretensions, I think we need both, but we have to uh, balance <coughs> it in the in, in right way. And for this, I would like to take a look on philosophy of science and philosophy of technology. Okay, I will unfold my topic in six short steps. First, to look for some new possibilities. Do we have really new possibilities to find new insights? And I would like to compare a little bit what we are doing in science when we are dealing with data and what we are doing <coughs> in business when we uh, are dealing with uh, data. And uh, then we could find that it remains an art to put the right question to the right data to, give, uh, to obtain the right answers. And uh, the question now is, do numerical approaches really substitute science? I don't think, but we cannot uh, refrain from it, so we have to balance it a little bit more. And I will show you two examples for this geomarketing and uh, HR, that means human research uh, management, uh, where we have uh, a very, uh, all, already a more or less major application of big data technology and artificial intelligence in this field. And last but not least, some remarks to responsibility. Okay, let's start with a new big possibilities. Okay, today we know speed, only speed is not witchcraft. We know it from the magics. And uh, the amount of uh, the speed of calculation, the uh, amount of uh, storage capacity, uh, even computer capacity has grown so much that we sometimes believe there should be some uh, quantitati uh, qualitative jump by this quantitative, uh, quantitative measure. Uh, I don't think so, because it uh, depends a little bit from the different context we are looking on the different levels. Okay, for instance, this nice uh, doc here is, okay, what, what will do a pattern recognizer if he, uh, if he get aware from this? Uh, maybe he makes a model. But it, it, the recognizer makes a model as a little bit far, but we have to sharpen then the model. But this depends upon uh, very, very sensitively. It, it depends upon because what we want to do with the model. For instance, do we really want uh, to make a, an artificial dog, or would we like to make a, a painter like a like Picasso? So it's. Um, Different fields, different context. We should not mix them together. And um, the model building in one field may be not appropriate for a model building in another field. I think we can uh, come a little bit closer to that. Okay. Uh, what about we talking? This is so uh, you know that. So I can make it uh, quite fixed. Uh, we're dealing with data science. Of course, databases are quite old stuff and. Um, very well settled. Uh, we have statistics that has not only to do, of course, with data, um, but also it's uh, mathematical methods. And very often we are using in big data, for instance, we are using uh, the mathematics of the last two centuries. So uh, I think uh, the, the real qualitative jump is that we have a huge amount uh, of, uh, of capacity, velocity. Okay, you know, the big uh, Vs in, in this definition of uh, the big data and the data mining. <coughs> um, pattern recognition is quite a little bit older than uh, big data, but has become always uh, uh, 
yeah, a very, very improved application. And then uh, as a new set, newer informatics, and of course, the machine learning. But the machine learning is not very new, okay? It's all, uh, it's all about the same thing with a big jump. It's, uh, we have uh, vast volumes of data and uh, capacity of computing. But uh, if you may remember, the first neural net or the first model of a neural net has been built by Steinbuch, by Karl Steinbuch in Karlsruhe at the Technical University and has been called Lernmatrix, matrix, matrix of learning. And uh, the, the principle is the same as it has been, uh, has been uh, uh, adapted by the, the models of McCall's and Pitt, and this was in the year of 1947. Okay, so the principles are not very new, but the application is new because we have now the technical means to do this. The question is in which, in which context we will do this. Um, in big data analysis, we have to distinguish between descript descriptive anal analytics, so we are all only presenting the results. The predictive analytics, we make forecasts. As a prescriptive analytics, when we draw, try to draw conclusions uh, from a data analysis, what we have to do. And the question is here exactly, do we use it in a decision substituting way or in a decision supporting way? And uh, this is, uh, I think, the actual question, uh, actual discussion in uh, philosophy, in philosophy of science, even in philosophy of technology, how far we could go when we try to substitute decisions by technology devices and by technology methods. And the question is even with big data, and uh, we will see this later on uh, in the example of the human uh, resource management. Can we substitute decisions in human resource management by big data analytics, by big data methods, by big data methods? Okay, let me begin very, uh, very, very simple uh, example. Um, say my first question is I would like to know uh, where a dice is faked or uh, is biased in some what I do, I try to throw these dices and uh, I make a process, and this process delivers me some data. This data already are collected with a scope of the interest. Is a dice fake or is it not? So, a very small set of data, of course. The next step is I run to analytics, I must rearrange, I must calculation, I must visualize it. I must uh, look on uh, what kind of mask I'm looking for the data for the purpose of my statistical analysis. And the statistical analysis is dependent upon my question of my interest, what I want to know. And this question I should pose before I'm starting with throwing the dice, with collecting the data, and uh, using statistical anal uh, analytics. Well, okay, this is a classical rearrangement. I look frequency of the zones, I try to visualize it, um, and this is the result of this data analysis I call information. This information is not yet knowledge. Why? To look only for this visualization here <clears throat> doesn't tell me anything. But if I have the background to say, okay, what was my interest? What question I have posed, now I can see, okay, this uh, number two is perhaps a little bit more than the otherwise could be there is a bias. So <clears throat> I must understand this information with respect to pre-information and with respect to my pre-knowledge. Otherwise I can't gain, uh, I can't gain a, good, a good knowledge. Or uh, beside this, the, trans the transformation from information to knowledge means to understand information in the background of my pre-knowledge and this takes time. So the availability of information is not yet the availability of the knowledge. There is a time lag or a time lag between them. 
Okay, now uh, when I and, uh, and when I have understood this uh, little uh, visualization here, I can say, okay, I have two possibilities. Uh, the data are not sufficient uh, to decide because uh, this here is not uh, significant enough for me, for my interest, with respect to my interest. Um, all the number two is really, really biased uh, whatsoever. And then the decision when I have, okay, I make more experiments, I will do more experiments, uh, or say, okay, it's enough for me, I've removed the one dice, it's uh, really faked, uh, so that I can act according to my decision. That's a way to do uh, science in a very, very simple, in a very, very simple case. Uh, and I must use it in the counter, uh, in, the, in the clockwise direction. The point is now, and there's a, say, there's a big, um, um, uh, how to say, this is seduction, or this very seductive to say, okay, if I have the information, it's enough. Then I run directly from the information to the decision. Okay, so this is a field of big data, and some, uh, not all scientists, but some scientists has claimed that this gray field here will be enough and will substitute the whole circle. And my play tonight is uh, that is not enough. Why? Let me go to this visualization. Uh, of course, you can use very tricky. Uh, you can uh, skip the zero line. Uh, you can make only some selections from the data. Uh, you can simplify it very, uh, very nice. Uh, all these uh, are the usual, uh, usual methods to lie with statistics, but it's not lying with statistics, it's lying with visualization. And this visualization, of course, doesn't respect or doesn't take, take into account what, what was the question at the very beginning. Okay, if I don't know the question at the very beginning, then I can't make such uh, tricks like that. Well, Let's go to the science method and say, okay, but I have no time enough when I do business to make such elaborated scientific methods. Is this really true? I don't think so. Uh, let me go with a very uh, simple, uh, another simple example. I want to uh, use a canoe. Uh, scientifically speaking, I want to figure out uh, whether my theory about the parabolic curve uh, is uh, can be uh, can be supported by, by the experiment. Experiment name means a device, a process, and the preparation of the boundary and initial conditions. So it's very important. Otherwise, I cannot understand uh, the process and I cannot make any forecast. But forecast, it's, uh, it's, it's okay. I must prepare this device or this uh, process or whatsoever. Then I have a theory, a hypothesis or together with air friction and so on. And then I compare, can I compare with the observations? Uh, very often observation and forecast doesn't fit together to a certain extent, then I have to uh, look what, uh, what, what, what could be done. Okay, in physics, in natural science, I have the nature to be observed, a device or a machine, and mostly, mostly in physics and in other natural science, the process we are um, observing, the process we are uh, testing, making experiments, are supported by technical device. Okay, then I must know the boundary conditions. Uh, the process can be influenced or not. In one case, I can say something about the input-output behavior with a citrus paribus. Uh, condition, otherwise I have a measurement without any in interference. So uh, that's not so very important. Important is on the theoretical side that I present this device by in tables, but I have no other knowledge about it, by diagrams, or by curves, or by equations, or in the more theoretical, sophisticated, in say, more groups of symmetries or so, for instance in physics. Here I have to know the, the range of the, uh, at least the range of the boundary and initial conditions. And this gives me a range also what I can prepare in, uh, so, to, so to say, in, re in reality. 
And then I calculate from this, say, this equation, so the solution of the equation with respect to the boundary conditions, then I can make some forecast. I calculate B, say, the uh, resulting variable as a, uh, uh, as a function of A. So, uh, this, is a, this is a coincidence between the function with respect to what the nature or the machine is doing on the run side and a mathematical function I can calculate. And both coincides, and uh, if both coincide, then I can say something about the quality of the model, sorry, the, of the model, uh, whether the nature or device or machine is really mapped on a model in a good way by the diagrams or by equations or whatsoever by my, by my model. Okay. So, uh, this comparison is very decisive and it's, um, it decides more or less whether my model uh, will be accepted in science or not. What I'm doing now is to go to technology and say, okay, I know something about uh, my scientific doing. I know the so identification like E, uh, if E then uh, will be followed or is a consequence or is a cause and effect. And if I want to have B, it's my technological interest to realize a state B, then there is a so-called pragmatic syllogism that has been introduced by Mario Bunge in the 60s, said, okay, then try B per A. And B per A is not a physical law, but it's a technological rule. A physical law can be very general and true or false. A technological rule is not true or false, it's effective or not effective. You can use it or you can, cannot use it. And if you apply it, it runs, uh, it, it brings you the wanted effect, or uh, it does not. So, if you look for this, say, scientific knowledge on the left side, you have data A, data B, and try to model then in a, a function like uh, calculation of B is given by a function of A. Uh, and mostly say, okay, I interpret this as a causal relation. As I say, I, uh, when I say it's experimentally confirmed, uh, in comparison with uh, input-output behavior, then this will happen in, within the nature, to say this is a hypothetic, realistic uh, standpoint. It's a little bit against the concept of this. Okay, and if I know this relation, then I can say, okay, when I want to have B, then this relation gives me what I have to do even means to select A uh, to have the effect B. Okay. That's the application of this rule, due to the knowledge if A then B. It's, this is very pragmatic because it doesn't tell something about uh, proof uh, about ontologies, how hard things really are, but it's a presupposition to say, okay, I start with a hypothesis that this causal relation Relates uh, to a real ontology, and A uh, and A follows uh, B is followed by A is a part of the real world, and then I can do it in the real world. I act in the real world. Say so, okay, so the action to be into a practice, and E of course uh, A of course must be feasible. Okay, and this is the foundation of the technological rules. They are effective or not? But the point is that uh, that this old engineering experience, I can use a technological rule and I can act successfully uh, only by knowing um, uh, only by knowing the rule. It is not necessary to know exactly what is the foundation that E follows B or B follows to B. Okay. That's enough to, to act in a successful way. And very often we are mixing these rules together with the theoretical knowledge and vice versa. Uh, beside, uh, beside this, uh, this uh, gray line here, if A uh, follows B and uh, B is, uh, is wanted, then try B per A, is not a logical expression. There is no, uh, there is no, logical, uh, there is no logical calculus in which you could prove such an expression formally, even not in model logic. The question is now, are data analytics 
sufficient to establish a certain probability for the efficiency of the technological rule to act. Does it belong to now okay with a, a result of data, uh, uh, of big data results? Uh, I have a certain probability to say, okay, this rule could be effective or not. It is really sufficient. Let us look how to do in a business. Uh, starting with the enterprise, that's my object, or the subject, my subject area. And I'm starting uh, when I'm collecting data, not for fun, but because I have a problem. I have questions, I have interests, I have uh, to solve I have to solve uh, a problem in order of, for instance, to improve uh, to improve the efficiency of my production or whatsoever. Okay, interest questions and of course certain business model. Business model is an answer where I do stand with my product and with my production within the value chain. That was a business model uh, for the answer. Okay. And I can start and say, okay, so let me collect from this subject area uh, data. I make measurement, say measurement, data collection, whatsoever, but with respect to this problem. No other, no other relevant data, but only data <coughs> with this respect. Okay, with this data, I can make myself analytics, like in the throat dicing before. I have information about products, tax, charts, tables, and so on, so what, what is presented. And then I try to understand it, that's the cognitive act, and this understanding already depends on the already uh, post problem. Otherwise, otherwise you, cannot, you cannot understand it. And with this pre-existing knowledge, you try uh, to understand it together, knowledge why, how, when, and so on. And then you make the decision, and the decision, of of course, is uh, if, um, uh, say if the, if the distribution of the probabilities of your option is a little bit flat, then okay, your interest uh, will um, <coughs> will influence yeah, your decision uh, in an unforeseeable way. And of course, suddenly other interests are coming in, other big data may come in and mix, so of course they are available, so okay, okay, take them in, try it, try it, take them with and so on, try it and so on. And you see this is a complete other way uh, to make decisions, to use data to gain information, to gain knowledge, and to use it for decision. And sometimes I have some shortcuts, or shortcuts like that here. Uh, and Sometimes one have the impression that the whole uh, data analysis should be in vain or it could be substituted by a, yeah, by an airy fairy decision because, <laughs> because it's, uh, there is some uh, contradiction to other, to the other interests. Okay, and then you act uh, on this subject error and try to uh, change something with the enterprise. So the problem is now how to come from information, from this analytic information, to a real, to a good understanding. Is it really enough to make decision uh, according to those results? That's uh, from a big data program from SAP. Okay, these are charts. Okay, that's a result of an analysis. Is this enough to make really uh, good decisions? Or, uh, or you try to delegate the decisions. Uh, okay, it's quite so clear, so we can automatically uh, uh, do this uh, and say, okay, lower this up or go this down or something. That's so self-understanding that I have not yet made some understanding processes, but to delegate the decision to the machine automatically. This would be uh, decision supporting, uh, decision substituting models uh, of an application. <coughs> that's, that's the thing. So I uh, come back a little bit and say, okay, we should really. Uh, distinguish between process, what we are measuring, the so signal, that's a data collecting. Then uh, we have to symbolize, we have to make the arrangement, all this arrangement, then we have to make by the algorithm and the information and then the knowledge, and this is a cognitive process, and then the decision. Okay, and if you uh, look here, then you see that um, the current, sorry, pointer? There should be a, hmm? there should be a pointer. Oh. Uh, okay. So 
Uh, these are common dependent operations. These are formal operations, and these are the human operations. And the question is whether the human uh, operations in this uh, in, in this uh, series uh, of things can be really um, yeah substituted. And the available information alone by files, by books, charts, and I give means whatsoever, is not yet large. It's not yet large. So I really want to emphasize this, uh, this difference. As a business model, okay, expresses interest. This, extra, uh, this interest uh, give rise to some ontologies, say, the decision of what belongs to the model and what not. Or what is, what is the limitation between the model and the environment? System and not system. So that's uh, the border between <coughs> system and not system. And this, of course, give us uh, some shadows to the cognition and to the decision. And otherwise, these ontologies and these models uh, determine the way of measurement of the pattern recognition and the arrangement, and of course, of the selection of the algorithm. And sometimes you have a back chain from the algorithm to the ontologies because you have perhaps the one or the other algorithm available and the other not. So show me your toolbox and I will show you how your models uh, work out. Okay, um, taking serious these dependencies, then it really depends from the way how we ask. So to put the right question remains uh, an art. Okay, I will run uh, quite quickly through this because uh, in uh, uh, computer science it's uh, uh, relatively clear uh, what, what, it, what is done. We have uh, to make statements, interpret them statements about the world. We have to formalize it in text, phrases, pictures, data, okay, with symbolization, pattern expression, formatting with mask, and so on. And then we try to calculate with all this uh, nice uh, formal prevariate results. And then we get a formal set of consequences from this statement about uh, uh, from this statement resulting from the processes of symbolic expression. No more. Well, the next point is now very decisive, saying uh, a substitution of symbols by data, pictures, text, so deformalizing and to interpret this as a statement about the world. That's what we are doing when we make forecasts in physics. That's what we are doing when we're making forecasts in business. Case is all the same. But this step is not self understandable. It had a lot of prerequisites and it depends very, very, again, it depends very, very sensitively from the first question we have posed. And then we can say, okay, have we won really a new statement about the world? We are doing it, we, uh, we don't do this uh, if, we, if it would be possible without these uh, procedures, of course. And the problem is then the compatibility. And the basic problem in big data is if I have collected data with, uh, with origin from different contexts, do they really match this empirical interpretation in this context with the original context with which I have made my symbolization, my pattern extension, my formality, my masks, and so on? Information may produce knowledge. What are the conditions for that? Uh, a decontextualized uh, information, that means information not adequately interpreted, may lead to wrong or misleading knowledge. If knowledge is one of the most important presuppositions of the ability to act, okay, this quite a triviality, wrong knowledge may lead to wrong acts. And the point is that uh, in analyzing big data with the training sets and so on, we are forced, because it doesn't work uh, in another way, we are forced to uh, use abductive uh, uh, conclusions. So you can do it deductively, but uh, you, run not very, uh, you, uh, you will not uh, proceed very far. You must need adaptive, but it's serology wrong. You can only falsify. And always say, okay, this is to, to a certain extent. And this certain extent, this view depends already uh, on, and again, uh, or, uh, depends again from the, uh, from the original question. 
And of course, the normal inductive, uh, inductive contribution, okay, this is uh, P, then will be estimated by empirical science and type of solutions. So the point is that this mu is very, very dependent on the original, um, <coughs> original question. I will show a, a quite assertive uh, example. Uh, you see here a young lady from a Renaissance painting. Uh, and she looks very nice, like a, uh, like a mother looking on her child or so. And it's the same data set, only put it in a little bit other context. And suddenly we have a very arrogant young lady here. It's the same, it's the same data. It's masked or uh, yeah, featured a little bit in another way. You get a complete another interpretation. Okay, maybe this is very suggestive. But I would like to put your uh, attention on, the, uh, on this context or uh, on this context or, uh, Of course, uh, one should start with the hypothesis. Uh, is the question meaningful? Um, a hypothesis with low probability in terms of causal effect, of course, you can find uh, like a little bit nonsense like this here. Uh, so we have a high correlation between civil engineering doctorates awarded and per capita consumption of mozzarella cheese. Um, or a, a counterintuitive uh, a negative correlation uh, between works of visual art copyright and females tend to get by uh, sitting or by trading. Okay, that means you can find, if you, if you pose a from cash, uh, question, you can find with respect to relation and everything. The problem is to put an a priori probability for your hypothesis with which you're starting. Otherwise you can find everything and the question is whether it's really uh, meaningful or not. So if the applicative reasoning is used constantly in big data methods, then it's not an adequate method to ground judgments, not to find hypothesis not to find a problem, but to ground judge, uh, judgments. And we so, should be very, very careful, for instance, in the field of sociology or human research management on related fields. In technical fields, we can corrugate this, uh, we can corrugate. So knowledge won by big data information is not reliable and only good or should be used for the finding of hypotheses. And very often, you can't ever then use big data to find hypotheses. So I will not, I will not bury big data, no. But such hypothesis should then, afterwards, treat tested more iteratively, like, uh, uh, like the example with the, with the dice is, uh, by more data, experiments, observations, inquiries, and so on. Even at, uh, after there are some economic uh, relations or uh, in sociology or psychology and so on. But, Unfortunately, due to cost and capacity reason, very often such additional tests and experiments are omitted, mostly in the business context. Because I'm in a hurry. Okay, so I take the first, uh, yeah, the first glimpse, and uh, yeah, the first, uh, the first impression. And. Um, here we have the question of responsibility. To take responsibility for success and reliability of the use of big data results remain with the user of such systems. Such that you try to use a procount or institute here or so. But this responsibility cannot be delegated. I will show you this later. Now some people have made some claims and say, okay, why if we have such big methods like big data? We can found things never seen before, because uh, we have now this, all these new possibilities. Uh, why we don't omit science? It's, it's really necessary to make these boring, uh, uh, boring methods, uh, like in science, because are so and, and they cost uh, a lot of money, a lot of uh, mental efforts, and, uh, and a lot of, a lot of time. Uh, and the most prominent. Um, or a, a proponent of uh, uh, such, um, such approaches uh, is Chris Anderson, this guy here in the field, 
and they say all data available by social network, scientific data, company data, and collected with the network, okay, put everything together. Due to inquiries and data, all these form a massive corpus as a laboratory of human cognition. And then uh, forces us to view data mathematically first and establish a context for it later. So that's exactly the other way around the <laughs> ES. And they say, um, and when they have discussed, so for instance, Norik, uh, the Google, the former Google research um, director, he said, um, uh, what if the model is going to be wrong anyway? Why not see if you can get the computer to quickly learn a model from the data rather to have a human laboratory derived model from a lot of thought? Okay. This is uh, the trial to find a via regia, like a king's, a king's way. Is it really a king's way? Uh, Anderson said the new availability of huge amount of data. And, and so on, offers a whole of new ways of understanding the world, understanding the world without having those questions before. Correlations supersede causation, and science can advance even without Korean models unified theory or really any mechanistic explanation at all. Um, correlations supersede causation. This is true even in physics but only as a first step. Otherwise, you have uh, to design experiments to confirm it or to reject it. And you know, according to Popper, uh, there's no absolute confirmation of a hypothesis, but only um, yeah, the uh, certain, certain prone of a hypothesis against uh, the trial to reject them. Okay. And can you really advance without coherent models? I think no. When we analyze the data without hypothesis about what it might show, we can throw the numbers into the biggest computing cluster the world has ever seen and let statistical algorithms find patterns where science cannot. The question is, are these patterns meaningful or not? Are they really meaningful? Um, well, I know, I know the pressure. Rockefeller has said, I spent half of my advertising budget for free, and I'd like to know which, to know which one. Okay, that's what business people need, really need. And the pressure is, uh, is, is uh, really impressive. The idea that business collect massive sets of data that may be homogeneous or automatically collected. Decision makers need access to smaller, more specific types <coughs> of data from those larger sets. They use data mining to uncover the pieces of information that will inform leadership and help chart, of course, for a business. But how to do it? Is data, is big data and artificial intelligence enough for that? Uh, providing us with invaluable insights about whatever rather than, uh, than the why. So it's important to look rather for the what than for the why. So we refrain from explanation, we refrain from causal explanation and let it be with the you know, phenomenological rules. Okay, correlation can be used to establish technological rules, of course. So, okay, if the correlation is quite high, okay, try it, why not? Okay, then you may, can, can make your own experiences. But it is really uh, <coughs> important enough, uh, this argument, to refrain uh, from science. Let me show very short, you know this, so it can, I can make it short because it's a little bit technical, um, the difference between scientific explanation and data analysis. I take um, measured values to each point of, of T. So this uh, are a little bit uh, not, so, not so smooth, so okay, with a, some error, uh, error ranges and so on. And I try to make a fit, uh, to calculate a curve that try uh, in order to make uh, exponential uh, smoothing or color filter or uh, a very simple uh, a kind of uh, seamless or whatsoever. I need a mathematical expression to make forecasts for this curve I have met. I don't know what it means. 
I have no physical idea or so, or the business process behind it or so. I don't know. I only need a mathematical expression to make forecast. So this can be very easily done. For instance, for the least square feet, I take a polynomial uh, expression or a, um, or a Fourier expression uh, and uh, with, a, uh, with a condition that the difference between theoretical curve and measured curve should be minimal, so the sum of the square should be minimal, I get, um, I get these uh, coefficients and I can fit them. And then I can use this to make a forecast. That's one way. So I can make forecast without any explanation. The other thing is to make physical explanation, uh, explanations that, okay, when I have a, a, a sinus wave like that, so it smells uh, according to a harmonic uh, motion with a linear restoring, uh, restoring uh, force, okay, for instance, linear pendulum or previous data model or market behavior or, or, or others. And this data analysis provides the possibility of forecast to a certain extent, of course. It could be uh, used to find hypothesis and say, okay, this looks like harmonic, let me look for a physical or another model. But it doesn't provide, and that's a, a, that's a difference, it's no scientific explanation, what nature the process is. You cannot conclude only from data what nature of the, uh, of the data producing process may be. And even, but every explanation, of course, is provisional. So we can start with this on the left side, but we should not omit the, the right side. <clears throat> so if we, if we have a, found an elegant solution to find a needle in the haystack, we would need to have a model presentation of the needle so that we know for what we are looking for. And with operative filters and new combinations and mask arrangements, it is always possible to find something under. However, the question is, what do these structures and patterns tell us? Or rather, what do we believe that they should tell us something at all? For this, I should know my original question. And without theory, it is possible to provide multiple data interpretation, including everything and nothing. But nevertheless, without theory, we have to start with data analysis and then produce further iteratively. So this is no forbidden to make big data, but it's only the first point in a cognitive and a scientific process. So the criticism to big data should remain fair. And um, OK, there's a lot of real impressive uh, progress that can really uh, use and uh, no uh, objections against, against that. Um, and the critics of claims uh, should not cover to those uh, no serious data scientists that have made it. Anderson is a little bit, mm, lots, lots of serious uh, case, I confess. Uh, and we should not confuse the limitation of prototypes with fatal flaws and okay to say, okay, if, uh, well, the branch uh, inclined sometime a little to have a big mouth and uh, then uh, fatal flaws are, of course, uh, used to pick it up and uh, then the criticism starts. Uh, but uh, and the very often the iterative character of the development in big data is overseen. And uh, we know all these wrong pr uh, uh, predictions, uh, taking philosophers and, and, and sociologists and so on, and even engineers have made in, in, in the past. But nevertheless, okay, to, to, to remain fair, I think it's a good idea to adapt here uh, a Kant, uh, uh, proverb of Kant, he said, thoughts without perception are empty, intuitions without concepts are blind. And Klaus Meinzer has transformed this to say, algorithm without theory and laws are blind, and correlation and data patterns cannot substitute explanations and groundings of causal relations. Therefore, we need a power of judgment. Um, due to the uh, time running away, let me come. Um, maybe you know you know these two uh, you know these two uh, examples. Do you know this address uh, am Kupfergram in Berlin? Who is living there? 
I mean, I'm like, that's a private, uh, yeah, he, had, he had the private, uh, uh, it's a private uh, apartment. Uh, and uh, one, uh, there is a nice um, thing to, for the application of geo marketing. He said, okay, take all data from houses, surveys, mail orders, steps, and so on, uh, collect all data, and uh, put it together to at least five households, households, and then you can make some results about the Kupferkarten the address of Angela Merkel. Uh, most of the houses are built before 1900, six households, construction sectors, very no garden available, no foreigners, no foreigners, affinity to loyalty cards is medium, the affinity to private health insurance is medium, Residents are distant in disinterest in financial business. <laughs> Classical landing users, hardware internet power users, dominating age 58 to 60. Diabetes and osteoarthritis about average, and fitness uh, below average, and a lot of Audi Mercedes and BMW and Okay. Who is using this uh, result of this uh, big data analysis? So, uh, interested sites, of course, engineers, suppliers, uh, uh, banks, um, food stores, marketing, advertising, uh, until uh, or uh, up to the uh, assurance companies and uh, and banks uh, as decide whether you got a credit uh, alone or not. So living in the wrong place can lead to worse conditions for obtaining a loan. Um, data protector uh, Peter Sharp has has comments. Okay, this one example, okay, can, you can use this. The question is whether this is really together with, now, or but it could be in conflict with the idea of democracy, equality, uh, and fairness. So um, we should be careful with this instrument. It's a very powerful instrument, but we should be careful because it depends already from the, from the starting interests. Another field is the so-called Personalwesen in German, the human research management. It's a big, uh, uh, it's a big art uh, to mediate the skills demand and the skills supply of the market of orders or labor market and the market of work tasks and projects. And uh, you run really in problems like Google if you have 2,000 applications per day. How to handle this? These are big firms. Okay, the answer of Google was we apply artificial intelligence and big data. Uh, now, uh, this is a classical thing. Um, uh, this is a classical structure. Our uh, internal uh, in a, in a company, an internal human research management is working. Um, data from the staff. Uh, Decision support and system interfaces with other analytics and go back and make decisions. Okay. This is from only data within the firm, within the company. Big data allows you now to make uh, data to, to use data to deliver database uh, to deliver data to database platforms, job uh, and mortgage agencies, and to uh, order back or to do it in the cloud for provider that offer you. Uh, analytics. And this here we have really the danger of decision substituting processes to say, okay, we make the matching uh, of the application and of all internal other mind data and from the social network and give you uh, give you an advice uh, which application would be accepted and which not. And if you have two thousand a day, okay, you try to automate to automatize this decision. I can understand it, but uh, of course, it's not very, uh, <laughs> it's not very, um, yeah. yeah, whether it fits uh, with our, uh, with our ideas of, uh, of participation, uh, uh, of uh, good governance of, uh, of firms, of uh, a good leadership, and so on. Okay, so, uh, the data is exactly sur uh, leaving this this borders of the great system. Great system is uh, within the, uh, uh, within the 
So the whole effect and reasons of an introduction of people analytics here, better accuracy, acceleration of decisions, reliable decisions, reduction of time and cost, and so on, a lot of uh, promising factors. An instant here, uh, these are the predicate factors for the termination of employment, so-called Kündigo. And uh, you can see if uh, uh, can see if uh, some of these uh, positive or negative influence are fulfilled, you can make some to a certain probability. You can make a forecast whether this uh, 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 whether this employee will leave the company, say, in three months or so. Okay, this is to uh, in order to prevent. Uh, too much, uh, to too much flow, too much uh, uh, personal flow to help the good, uh, uh, the good people, uh, the, the experts, and to bind them to, to the firm. And this is uh, a trial to foresee, to make a forecast about the possible danger of, uh, of a termination uh, of employment. The question is how safe or how, how reliable uh, this. Uh, uh, it's, it's, but but it, it, it's really used. Um, uh, I skipped this due to time. Uh, as an effect, this decision making replaced with the help of people and analytics prevent, of course, necessary participation. The use of personal people analytics in decision substituting mode will cause conceivable to a reinforcement and prolongation of the inheritance effects. Okay, so to say something bad in the C and will signalize applications by past data. Conceivable uh, can show that uh, uh, it's possible to promote discrimination as an inheritance effect. It depends, of course, from the trainee set, of course. And there's a responsibility gap. Who is responsible for the decision if it is done automatically? As a question of reversibility, it arises when using a so-called autonomous system or fully automated system. It has not been clarified under which criteria that can be shut off by the user. Okay, and we have it uh, already uh, installed. So let me come to the last uh, remarks about responsibility. Mm -hmm. The question of big data users come to a head with the question of a decision-making system that could make personal decisions on its own. So a distinction must be made between smaller companies, large companies, and platforms offering services in the area of human research management. Despite possible technical and economic benefits, the concerns overweight. That's a result of an analysis of the beginning, the beginning of this year. Although the diffusion of big data technology in the field of human resources has not progressed as far as some interested parties have suggested already. It is recommended to apply already strict standards for the use of such systems. And from a theoretical point of view, we come back to the very beginning, it turns out that as a result, personal analytics are also not very reliable. Moreover, their handling can lead to ethical dilemmatic situations possibly violating legal regulations such as informal self-determination, uh, in German it's uh, informational Selbstbestimmungsrecht, and right of participation and personal rights. And in general, one, can, one could argue that fully ruling an autonomous system should not be used in areas where personal security and integrity, core values, moral core values, human rights, and definable responsibility, including liability. A role. So that was my play. Uh, the references um, I can hand you a, a handout uh, of this uh, slides if you want to have it available. So I can uh, give you a link. And at this point, I try to close certain and open questions. Thank you. Example with the human resource to prove that they have so many applicants. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, uh, you pointed out the dangers of, uh, of these autonomous systems, but what would be the alternative? I mean, how would you, how should a large company handle those situations? Um, there are two alter alternatives. Um, to do it like Google, it is doing without any restrictions. Uh, and uh, okay, one must see what the long time effect will be in recruiting, uh, in recruiting the uh, staff. Uh, another uh, possibility are the regulations by uh, EU. Uh, European regulations. This um, uh, well, what is uh, what is the name of this? Uh, uh, Staten. The 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 What is it called? In, in, uh, the data protection. The data protection regulation. Yeah, so this protection regulation. Um, it could for uh, it uh, it forbids, for instance, uh, to use in such systems uh, some uh, some variables like uh, I think like a or sex, or uh, religion, or sexual um, uh, uh, orientation, and, and things like that. But on the other hand, if, other hand, if you have a, a, a good trainee set, okay, you can make conclusions to even these variables. Um, and um, well, <coughs> the, the question is whether if you have to handle two thousand applications per day, whether you can handle these uh, decisions uh, fair enough uh, even with or without big data. I don't think you can, you can handle it in, in a fair way. So it's, uh, this is more a, a problem of, um, uh, of, of large systems. So the responsible may be, uh, or is lying perhaps a little bit before to say, okay, uh, avoid uh, uh, avoid systems or structures <coughs> in which you cannot handle any more uh, such decision processes in a fair way. So, one consequence of this of this principle would be uh, that you try to 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 to, to, to make partitions uh, to make partitions of this application. Say, okay, this should not run through one human research management uh, department. Uh, you have to divide it for different sections and so on. So uh, th this concentration process uh, was in Google due to the uh, technological possibilities, which are very expensive. So <coughs> use, it, use it one device for all, because the device is very expensive. Okay. Uh, the other consequence would be to say, okay, uh, try to install more devices, more possibilities, and divide it, and so. Uh, you, you have a problem that is can be handled perhaps in a more fair way. Google has chosen a cheaper way and raising the business. Because oh, it was a question of cost. Because it was the um, they were afraid of the lawsuits because it was proven to be biased and discriminatory against women and so in the end they decided it's cheaper for us to open up twenty new HR departments and deal with the lawsuits. More questions. But, but you cannot prevent discrimination with this. No, of course not. Okay, if, if the training set is bad, no, it cannot, cannot prevent it. Yes. I mean, I have to say I'm also sort of skeptical about the like widespread application of uh, artificial intelligence, most notably because the data quality, particularly in the business sector, is usually very bad. So you really apply artificial intelligence on junk data and then of course mm. the, the okay. output is obvious. But if I would have to argue for, for big data, I would say like in the end it's a matter of, of responsibility, is it not? I mean, uh, you, c you can argue, okay, that the algorithm can make a mistake, but then I can also argue when people make mistakes all the time. So like if you have an HR person, he can be sexist or he can be ageist or he can be, I don't know, whatever he can be. And in, in most companies you have one or two persons who decide these things. So. <coughs> mistakes are made on both sides, so so what then it's made on the big data side? Mm -hmm. um, it, it's true, uh, but on the other hand is, okay, people are doing, uh, doing mistakes, um, but um, one should not use technology in a way that is, uh, that there is an amplification of the uh, man-made mistakes. 
So uh, if you um, let me give an example from the automatic car. Uh, if you have a, 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 young, a, a young boy, 80, 80 years old, uh, you will not have him uh, SUV with uh, 300 PS or so. Because you know uh, this guy is doing uh, mistakes in the very beginning, <coughs> and these mistakes are fortified and amplified by, by a touch big device. <coughs> okay. So, uh, of course, it, it, it's true that we have chunk data and apply to artificial intelligence, it will not be very, very sensible. Uh, but what's, about, what's the source of the chunk data, or the bad data, is that the question has not posed, uh, uh, has not posed in an adequate way. It's only collect and say, okay, let's see, let's see, okay. Uh, all, all the data together with different quality and so on. So it's very, uh, then it's very different. Uh, I do not blame algorithm. Most of, of these algorithms uh, comes from the end of the 19th century. <laughs> the Fourier analysis, Kalman filtering, <laughs> exponential, uh, exponential uh, uh, smoothing, I think. It's, it's, it's quite old math. Okay, we kind of have functions and things or whatever. But it, it's a quite, quite old, old fashioned mathematics and statistics. Uh, I, I do not blame statistics, I do not blame the algorithm. I think that we uh, should uh, think about the application of, an, of adequate algorithm um, in, yeah, but with respect to the largeness of the problem. So that means um, don't, uh, don't use junk, uh, uh, junk data, uh, for instance, which, which are, have been collected only for uh, uh, 20 people, okay, and make a t-test. A t-test is not very reliable. So, uh, and, and you cannot use this results of a t-test for a real good, good decision. So uh, the chain from uh, question, uh, method, uh, algorithm, uh, information, knowledge, decision. So uh, this, this chain should be adjusted in a, uh, in a yeah, in, in a, yeah, how to say, in a, yeah. in, in, in a balanced way. Okay, uh, small data, such a big data algorithm doesn't work. Uh, such a big data, <coughs> small algorithm doesn't work. So is, is this should, uh, should have been in a, in, in, a in, in a balanced way. And moreover, to come from information to knowledge, it takes time. And if the problem is really different, one should take more time so sometimes in policy we have, uh, uh, in politics we have a uh, decision about uh, uh, four or six millions in two minutes, uh, and uh, decision about a uh, device in the kindergarten uh, takes three uh, three months for a decision. So yeah. so this uh, the, <coughs> the the size the size of the complexity of a problem should um, yeah. Should or should allow uh, 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 an adequate adequate time uh, for coming from information to knowledge, knowledge to decision, and to execute the decision. And this this change. Okay. Um, we've moved quite far beyond the time already. Um, perhaps some more questions are in order over a glass of wine. Mm -hmm. You can spare a few minutes in a more personal setting. Thank you very much for coming. Um, also, just the last reminder, we'll have another talk on the 21st of January um, about the political dimensions of uh, search engine design in Europe. Um, it's going to be very exciting. And of course, we're inviting you to join us there as well. Thank you for coming. Thank you.